Hi class, Dr. Jim here. In this lecture, we're going to look at animal digestion. And so we're going to take the time and look at the nutrients that we need, how animals support themselves, and then again, essentially how they get through the process of digestion. So we're going to look at not only uh, the human digestive system, but we're also going to look at other vertebrate animals and see how they, they digest their food to get the important nutrients that they need. Now again, what separates animals out from plants and other organisms like fungi is animals are heterotrophs, meaning they have to eat. So again, we have developed adaptations for us to eat. And that was, again, we looked at that during chapter 27 when we looked at the predation and again, the pr uh, production of jaws and the teeth and all that good stuff. So we'll look at that today uh, and some of the specific uh, adaptations that we came with. And then the other thing is, is that we do internal digestion. So what separates animals out from fungi is that they tend to uh, digest externally and then absorb everything through their, their cell walls. Whereas animals, they do everything internally. And so you're going to see that with the sponges all the way up to, to humans, we all have internal digestion. And so sponges, they have their uh, pores again, and they do filter feeding. And then you start to see the development of these gastrovascular cavities and then digestive systems as they go on. Here's just a cute little picture of different things of animals eating and that stuff. And again, we see that most animals uh, are either one of three types. They're either carnivores, which mean they just eat meat. They're herbivores, meaning they eat plants or they eat both, which is an omnivore. And so again, a lot of that has to do, and you can look at the teeth that these animals have and you can see what uh, they'll eat in that stuff. But again, it's all about getting nutrients and what nutrients are important. So we'll take a look at that as we go along today. So first thing we're going to ask is, why do animals have to eat? Very simple question. Again, we're going to look at that uh, and again, getting the nutrients that they need in order to survive. The second thing we're going to look at are what are the steps of digestion? So we're going to take our, take our time going through what digestion is. And again, look at the aspects and the organs that are involved with that. And that's kind of the third topic as well. Then we'll look at the organs needed for digestion. Where does chemical digestion take place? And look at what is the goals of each of the organs? What are they supposed to do and why do we have them? And then finally look at the adaptations that have correlated with various animal diets. And so we'll take a look at the differences between herbivores and carnivores and what does that effect have on their digestive system and that and some of these other organisms that are out there. Okay, so chapter 33, we're looking at digestion today. So we're gonna be talking about the stomach, the intestines, and looking at all those wonderful aspects that go on. So let's take the journey together and let's go through and see what we can learn about the digestive system. And again, the need to feed. So food is taken in and taken apart and taken up by the process and the process is known as animal nutrition. And in general, it falls into three categories. And I just mentioned this before. Herbivores mainly eat plants, carnivores eat other animals, and omnivores eat both plants and animals. And again, most animals are op also opportunistic feeders, meaning they're going to look for whatever source of food they can find and they're going to eat it. So again, that plays a role with the predator prey and then the herbivores as well. And again, has had major effects on evolution as, as we've seen in other chapters. Now, the animal diet must supply energy, organic molecules, and essential nutri nutrients. And so, again, chemical energy, which is converted to ATP and power of the cells. So you need the carbohydrates to do that. You need the organic building blocks, such as organic carbon, organic nitrogen, to synthesize a variety of organic molecules, the proteins, the proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and the lipids. And again, then we have the essential nutrients that are required by cells and must be obtained by dietary sources. And so, again, this is just the example of what we think of fruits and grains and vegetables and protein. And again, having a variety is always good. And so that's one of the things that we always have to think about is making sure we get the right nutrients uh, at the time. Now, essential nutrients must be obtained from the animal's diet. And again, these are four classes that we need. And again, essential amino acids to help build proteins essential fatty acids, which are helped to maintain, again, membranes as well as uh, neural transmitter, neural systems, hormones or lipids a lot of times, uh, and some of these other guys that we need, and then vitamins and minerals that are very important as well. And if we don't get these things, then they always suggest getting taking vitamin supplements and that stuff because they're important for the body as well. And you can kind of see in a list of some of the things that are necessary for for our bodies. So again, a fat, uh, linolytic acid, 
uh, prostaglandins are important, the phospholipids, again, the essential amino acids, which are listed here, mineral cofactor, the iron, and then the vitamin B3 as a coenzyme to work on enzymes and that stuff. And so you can kind of see different roles for these bodies. Now, some of the essential fatty acids and amino acids, again, uh, animals require 20 amino acids so they can synthesize half the molecules in their diet. The remaining amino acids are the essential amino acids and must be maintained from food. So we can make about half, but we have to get the essential ones, and these are the essential ones called, uh, on here. So histidine, isoleucine, leucine, lysine, methionine, phenylalanine, thyroene, tryptophan, and valine. And so again, these are uh, the essential. There's some uh, conditionally non-essential. Sometimes they're needed more, and then these guys are really non-essential amino acids in that. And again, looking at the different types that are there. So these we not necessarily have to get from our diet, and so that's that's the idea. Now, fatty fatty acids again, we need it for cellular components such as phospholipids, signaling molecules. I talked about hormones and storage fats again for energy storage and that. There are essential fatty acids, and again, we can't synthesize them, but they can be synthesized by plants. And again, we obtain these from these essential fatty acids by our diets. And this includes things like omega-6s. So you can see where, where these things come from. So this kind of gives you an idea and that where we get them. We also have the omega-3s. Omega and again, a lot of people are lacking in the omega-3s, so they take fish oil or some of these other things that, again, are very important. So again, we get a lot of these from our diet. These not so much unless you eat a lot of fish or seeds and that stuff. So again, that's why a lot of us are now taking supplements because we're lacking these omega-3s. And so a lot of times we get too many of these and not enough of these. And so that's the, that's the thing that we need there. Now, vitamins that are essential, again, these are the small uh, required in small amounts, but they're essential, again, for uh, enzymes and other functions in there. You can see the list of some of the vitamins that we need. A lot of times the B complexes and that, vitamin D, vitamin E, vitamin K, folic acid, vitamin A, and all these other things. And so you can see some of the different essential vitamins that we need and where we get them from. And again, natural source versus other sources. So yeah, taking a look at that. And then the minerals, again, these are inorganic nutrients and again, required in small amounts. And again, uh, getting these things from our diet, including things like manganese, calcium, sodium, copper, uh, again, fluorine, uh, cesium, iron, zinc, all these different things. And again, a lot of these are cofactors and enzymes as well as signaling molecules in our cells or transporters in that. So we need those as well. Now, again, dietary deficiencies. If we don't get these things, then we become malnourished. And again, this is a long-term absence from the diet of one or more of these essential nutrients. And again, we've seen the sad stories in that stuff, especially where you have a lot of famine and drought and other things. And again, a lot of people in India, as well as in uh, Africa, where we see a lot of malnourishment. And again, it says that, again, every third individual is malnourished in the world today. And so that's kind of sad that we live in a world as uh, complex and cosmopolitan as we have it, and we still see hunger as a major issue. And even in the United States, we see that as an issue and that stuff, which is a sad, sad state affair because the United States is a very uh, productive country, very rich country in you know history and also in, in monetary wealth as well. And we still have children going to bed hungry every night and that stuff. And that's kind of a sad statement to say uh, for this country especially in that. So we look at that and it can be uh, a tough, tough situation. Now, deficiencies in nutrients can cause deformities, disease, and death. And again, sometimes animals will get salt, mineral, and shells or stones to prevent mineral deficiencies. And you can see here this animal licking the rocks to get in some nutrients. And so sometimes it's essential because they're not getting, getting it in their diet. And so they have to get it from other sources. And so a lot of times you'll see animals licking rocks or ground or, or other things to get some of these minerals that they may be deficient in. Now, a diet insufficient amounts of one or more amino acids is the most common type of malnutrition in the, uh, in, among humans. Again, other diets often deficient in vitamin A. And so one of the things we've seen is, again, synthesizing food with uh, different vitamins in them. And so one of the things is this golden rice, which now has vitamin A and beta carotene in it. 
And so you see this thing called golden rice. And so this is one of the advantages of bioengineering. You're putting nutrients in food that now is available and help the malnourishment in different parts of the world. And so this is a good thing. And so this is where GMOs can actually be very helpful in that. And again, GMOs get a bad name, but again, this is one of the areas where it can be very beneficial in providing nutrients for uh, people that are malnourished in these situations. Now, undernourishment, again, can arise when diets don't provide enough. And again, what happens in individuals is they used up the stored fats and carbohydrates. They start to break down their own proteins. They lose muscle mass, again, because of the breakdown. You suffer pro uh, protein deficiency of the brain. And eventually, you can die and suffer irreversible damage. And again, this doesn't have to be a third world country. We're talking about in the United States, too, people with eating disorders. And again, things like anorexia or some of these other eating disorders where you definitely see this happen into people where they get uh, very, you know, due to the psychological effects and that stuff, they can basically waste away. And essentially, because they're not getting the nutrients that they need and their body starts to eat themselves. And so it's a sad situation when they're not able to uh, maintain their normal and uh, normal environment. And again, they get this malnourishment because they're not getting enough food to supplement their diet. And so that's that's a that's an interesting aspect as well when we look at that. Now, again, food processing can be divide, divided into four stages. And so you have ingestion, which is basically taking in the food and uh, bringing it in. Digestion, which is the chemical breakdown. And again, using the enzymatic hydrolysis. And then you have absorption in the intestines, which absorb the nutrients into the rest of the body. And then finally, you have elimination, which is getting rid of the excess or waste uh, or undigested material in these situations. And so again, this is why we eat. And so again, these are the four stages, ingestion, digestion, absorption, and elimination. And this is why we eat the food we eat, okay? Now, ingestion is the act of eating or feeding. And again, it's strategies for extracting resources from food different widely among animals. You can see here, this snake is eating this, uh, essentially has constricted this, it looks like an antelope completely, and now it is swallowing it whole. And so again, these guys have uninged jaws so they can swallow their food. Most animals, uh, again, predatory animals, have hinged jaws so they can't do that. So they have to chew up their food and break it down first before they can ingest it. And so depending on the type of animal, you see different mechanisms for ingestion. Now, digestion is the process of breaking it down. And again, we have mechanical digestion, which is our teeth. And again, some of the other things that help break these things down, the movement of the food and breaking it down this way. And then you have the chemical digestion, which is the enzymes which help break things down into smaller pieces as they pass through and allow it to pass through the membranes. And so again, in chemical digestion, you have hydrolysis that split bonds with addition of water and other things. The acid helps break these things down and you look at these different things as we see it. So again, when you eat that pizza, you can see all the different things that go on. And again, the ingestion is the bringing the food in, digestion is breaking it down, and then the next part is going to be the absorption of taking these small molecules once you've broken it down and then uh, absorbing it. Okay, so absorption is the uptake of nutrients, and then the elimination is getting rid of any, any undigested uh, material out of that digestion uh, system. And so, again, you can kind of see this ingestion is bringing it in, digestion is uh, breaking it down, absorption is absorbing the nutrients, and then finally elimination is getting rid of those undigested pieces. Now, again, in most animals, processed food in specialized compartments and again, the compartments reduce the risk of animals digesting their own cells and tissues. And so again, these systems are set up so that the digestion takes place in a closed system and that they're protected from not having them leak out. Obviously, people can have issues with that, but typically when we think of a closed system, you have a tube inside of a tube. And so our digestive system is kind of closed off from the rest of the rest of the body and again eliminates these different things as we go along and so again keeps it in the digestive system and not leach out into the rest of the environment. Okay now we can have intracellular digestion and so again when we think of single cells or in our bodies where you have these food particles that come in they can be digested internally by the phagosome. The phagosome is basically uh, brought in by the phagocytosis 
you attach to the lysosome, the lysosome contains the enzymes, and then you break these things down, and then the molecules are either uh, brought in and absorbed by the cell or released through exocytosis. So again, that's internal cells, and we see this during the process of absorption, and once the material is broken down and the individual cells are feeding on the little morsels. Now, extracellular digestion is essentially where it breaks out down outside the cells. And so, again, there's compartments that are continuous with the outside of the animal's body. And so, again, even in the simple animals like the cnidaria, what you have is this gastrovascular cavity, which essentially eats food, brings it in, and releases enzymes to break this down. And so, again, in this situation with the gastrovascular cavity, you have internal digestion, these get broken down and then the cells absorb the minerals once they're broken down. And then anything that doesn't go gets excreted back out through the mouth. And so again, whether you're a big animal like us or a small animal like the hydra, you do internal digestion inside a tube or a vessel inside the body that releases enzymes and then finally gets rid of the waste when, it, when it's been properly digested. Okay. Now, more complex animals have a complete digestive tract or an elementary canal, and again, with a full, with a mouth and anus. And so again, the mouth is responsible for bringing in food and the anus is responsible for the, the elimination of the waste products. And again, most animals have a complete digestive system. Again, it's really only the very simple animals like the, uh, the couple that I can think of that are very simple are the cnidarians. So again, the jellyfish or the hydra. And then the worms, the flatworms like the planaria, typically have only an incomplete digestive system. Most animals above that all have a complete digestive system. So they have a way of to bring in the food and then a way to release the food. And we'll, we saw this when we did the uh, view or the scan of the different animals. But we'll look again more closely at digestion, when, especially in the, in the pigs when we do uh, the dissection of the pigs. And we'll look at that as well as the frogs as well and look at that and see those different things. Okay, very similar. Okay, and again, it's the, the systems are the same way. It's a big, long tube. It just depends on the type of organs that you have. And again, these are some of the different things that you see. So sometimes you see crops and gizzards. Other times you see uh, stomachs uh, and that. And again, the roles of these things all depend on what they're supposed to do. And so again, we'll look at these uh, as we go along uh, throughout. Okay. Now, in the mammalian digestive system contains the elementary canal and the accessory glands that secretes the digestive juices. Again, it's one long tube all the way through. And again, the accessory glands and the salivary glands, the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder all contribute digestive enzymes that help break down the food. So they are a part of the chemical digestion. And we'll talk about where and what happens during each part of the digestive system here in a little while. Okay. Now the first stage of digestion is mechanical and takes place in the oral cavity. And again, the, chem the mechanical would be the grinding of the teeth, tearing it up. And then the chemical digestion would be from the salivary glands. And so you release saliva in the oral cavity to help, again, slide that down through the esophagus, as well as to start breaking down certain chemicals that are in the food. And so again, uh, one of the things that we have is amylase to help break down starches and glucose. Uh, polymers. Again, other things that we have is mucus and other things, water salts and glycoproteins, as well as some uh, uh, other lysozymes in that that help break down some proteins and other things in the saliva itself. So you start to see some chemical digestion as well. And we'll look at specifically what gets broken down here in a little while uh, when we look at chemical digestion. Now, in the upper digestion, again, the tongue shapes the food into a bolus, and so that bolus then works its way down into the esophagus. And again, one of the things that we have is the epiglottis, and that epiglottis helps close off so that we don't swallow food into our, our respiratory system. And again, that's an important part that's kind of the revolving door. Typically, it's closed when we're eating, and then it opens back up when we're breathing. And so again, sometimes you get water or food, and that's when we get when we start to choke. And so it goes down the wrong wrong hole, I guess, in that case, if you want to call it that, the wrong tube. And then you may have the response, like a coughing response, or you may need help, like the Heimlich response. And so you get the food out of there. And so, but hopefully it works its way down 
through the esophagus and towards the stomach. And you can see some of the different ways that we use this. So the teeth, uh, again, help cut and grind the food. The tongue helps move the food down, as well as the different salivary glands that help, um, again, provide chemical digestion to break down the food as it goes along. Now, swallowing must be close, carefully choreographed to avoid choking. And again, the epiglottis does protect that. And again, you want to make sure that it's closed before you swallow and all that stuff. And so a lot of times choking happens when we don't chew something fully and it gets kind of lodged in that area. And so that's one of the issues that, that people have. And again, then the esophagus conducts food uh, down from the pharynx down to the stomach using rhythmic cycles of contraction. We'll talk about, about that. That's called peristalsis. And again, causes the squeezing sensation to work its way down to the stomach. And again, the form of the esophagus fits its function in the various among species. And again, a round tube to work the food down to the stomach. Now, like I said, peristalsis is the rhythmic contractions of the muscles. And so the smooth muscles that line this help constrict and contract. And that contraction allows for the food to work its way down to the stomach. And so we have these waves that essentially help push it down. Now also we have these valves at the end of both the esophagus and on the other end uh, of the stomach and at the other end of the digestive system that help regulate the movement of material between the compartments. And so we'll see this a couple times. The first sphincter we're gonna see is the uh, gastric, uh, again, the gastric sphincter, or I think it's called the, um, I'm trying to esophageal sphincter in that case where again the food comes down and as the food comes down it allows for the sphincter to relax and allows for the food to enter in. Now some people have issues where they get heartburn and the acid from the stomach actually works their way through and can actually damage the esophagus and the sphincter itself if they have chronic heartburn and that and so people can develop that as well. Now once we get to the stomach you have the digestive or gastric juices, which basically convert the meal of the mixture into a di into the digestive juice called chyme. And so it goes from a bolus to now the chyme. You can see we have these pits inside of our stomach that release the acid. And then the acid is from these pareto cells, which take chlorine and the protons and convert it into hydrochloric acid. And the pepsidogen uh, is then converted to pepsin, which becomes the active enzyme that helps break down protein. And so the HDL helps convert pepsinogen to pepsin, and then you have this reaction to help digest the food in the stomach. And so this is how chemical digestion takes place inside the stomach. Okay, and this just shows you the glands and that, and again, the mucus cells that help coat the stomach to protect it so you don't get ulcers in that from the uh, acid that's produced. Now again, the gastric juice has a low pH, about two, which kills the bacteria and helps denature proteins. And again, it's made up of hydrochloric acid and pepsin, which helps break down proteins. And then it's a protease, meaning that it breaks down proteins and it cleaves proteins into peptides. And so that's typically the chemical digestion that's happening in the stomach is the pepsin breaking down the proteins in this case. Now the mucus in the stomach protects it from the gastric juice and then cell division keeps adding new epithelial layers every three days to replace any cells damaged by digestive juices. And so again, it's that chronic wearing away that can lead to ulcers. And so you can see here, here's a normal uh, stomach lining where you have this nice mucus layer as well as cells replacing, whereas you get damage where you get these areas where the ulcer forms. Now, most people, and this is my microbiologist coming at you, get ulcers because they have a bacterial infection. And so it's not actually due to, you know, worrying a lot or having stress or other things. What really happens most of the time is you get this bacterial infection called Helicobacter pylori, which sits in the stomach wall. It actually raises the pH uh, so they can survive in there. And then it causes this wearing away of the lining. The cells can't repair itself as fast. And so you get the cell damage as well as the mucus goes away. And so you see this damage occurring. And so that's the big issue when you talk about ulcers and that a lot of times is due to a bacterial infection and not just due to stress or worry with that. And so I think they said it uh, estimate about 90% of the ulcers are actually caused by bacterial infection rather than, you know, some of these other things that we think about stress or worry or something else that goes on in these situations. Now, a coordinated constrict, contraction, relaxation of the stomach muscle, churn the stomach contents. So it's kind of like this big bag that helps stir the stuff up. And then the sphincters prevent the chyme from entering the esophagus or coming into the small intestine. So again, you have this 
cardioesophageal sphincter up at the top, which keeps it from going back through the esophagus. And then you have the pyloric sphincter or the valve that keeps it from going into the intestines until it's ready. And so again, you get this digestion and typically it takes anywhere from two to six hours to go from the stomach into the intestine for the food to move in. And so it spends quite a while in the stomach just digesting and turning and processing the chemical digestion, breaking down the proteins and eventually going into the stomach. So you'd assume that probably things that are higher in protein are going to take longer to digest. And so that's one of the reasons why if you want to lose weight, they say eat a lot of protein because it takes longer to digest. And so it's one of those things that you have to sit there and break it down longer so you feel fuller and it takes you longer to break these things down. Same thing with fiber. That's the other thing because you can't digest it and it sits in your system and makes you feel full. Okay, now once the food, the bolus, and the chyme moves into the small intestine, it enters into what we call the duodenum. And we looked at that in chapter 32, how the cells regulate the pH. And so when it enters in here, travels through the pyloric sphincter and enters into the duodenum, what you see is that the pH goes up to about a, about a 7. Now what happens here is that digestion still occurs in the small intestine, but you now start to see absorption. And so again, in the small intestine, you see all these little villi that allow for the, again, increased surface area so you can do more digestion and absorption in these places. Like I said, first in is the duodenum, and again, the chyme mixes with digested juices from the pancreas, liver, gallbladder, intestinal wall to further break things down. And so again, we get further breakdown into smaller units and we start to see absorption in that, and then we move into the large intestine here in a minute. Now, the roles of the pancreas, we look at the pancreas, and again, one of the things that it produces is the chymotrypsin, which is activated by the duodenum. One, it helps neutralize the acidic chyme in there. We talked about that, the um, regulation of, again, the uh, secretinin. Secretinin gets released by the duodenum, which triggers the uh, pancreas to uh, add bicarbonate in and again causing the things to raise the pH up. So that's one of the things that it does. The other thing that it does is it releases this trypsin in that which helps also break down proteins as we go along. Now in the small intestine bile adds in digestion and absorption of fats and so again if you have a problem with your gallbladder or you're missing your gallbladder one of the things the doctor tells you is to watch fatty foods because you're not as likely to eat or not as likely to digest fats as well because you're missing a lot of your uh, bile and that and that bile helps break down the fatty tissue and so when you're losing your gallbladder because it gets blocked by a, a gallstone or it gets diseased or damaged you have this removed you still can make bile from your liver you just don't have a lot of it stored and so again it's more about moderation and so you still could eat fatty foods but you have to be very careful because you just don't produce or you don't have as much bile and so that's the problem. Bile is also the reason why your poop turns out brown because it adds that color, it adds the uh, there and so when you see damage to the liver a lot of times you get jaundice in that and that's the bilirubin that accumulates well that's the color in the bile and that the greenish color and that and that gives you the color that you see in your poop. So that's why you see that. It also destroys non-functional red blood cells as well. So the ones that are um, that are dying. Now let's take a look at the chemical digestion. So we talked about this first. So really in the oral cavity, uh, the one that takes place there is in the saliva. So you have this amylase that helps break down the polysaccharides. So things like starch and glycogen, sucrose and lactose and maltose into smaller uh, polysaccharides. So that's the first thing you see. So primarily in the mouth, the chemical digestion is going to be uh, on the on the sugars in that. Okay. Then when you move to the stomach, the stomach will also continue on with the carbohydrate digestion and has, again, enzymes that break these things down, as well as the protein digestion with the pepsin. And so, again, that's what takes place with the acid, and that helps break down the protein. So, again, in the stomach, so now you got carbohydrate and protein digestion. And then finally, when you move into the small intestine, you start to see the rest of the nutrients being uh, broken down. So again, you see carbohydrate de uh, digestion with, again, pancreatic amylases. You see more protein digestion with trypsin and chymotrypsin. Uh, and then you now start to see nucleic acid digestion through the nucleases that are found in the pancreas. And then the pancreatic lipase along with bile with the fat digestion. And we're going to look at all these. So really, 
the main place of digestion and chemical digestion takes place in the intestines, but the stomach and the mouth start the carbohydrates and the protein digestion first, and then the rest of these things get digested in the small intestine. Okay, and then the other, other things from other chemicals as well for carbohydrates, again, you see digestion, that protein digestion, and then nucleic acid as well. So we've talked about all these different things as well. Now, absorption starts to take place in the small intestine as well. And again, that's why you have the villi and the microvilli, which again, increases the surface area so you can digest more. And so the enormous microvilli surface area creates broader uh, brush broader of increased rate of nutrient absorption and again without it we wouldn't be able to absorb as well and so that villi really increases surface area so you can absorb that much more food and so again makes it much more efficient and a much more efficient system otherwise we'd be pooping a lot more uh, if we didn't absorb quite as much in that so it does help with that uh, the absorption and you can see here again the blood vessels are attached to the intestine they absorb the nutrients and that stuff we see the absorption with the villi you increase the surface area by having more of these as opposed to just a flat surface you have so many more cells to absorb these cells absorb and then pass the nutrients into the blood and so those things get into the blood and do those different things and then absorb the food or the nutrients, I'm sorry, in these cases. Now, one of the important veins in this case is the hepatic portal vein, which carries nutrients, blood from the capillaries to the villi, to the liver, and then to the heart. And again, the liver regulates the nutrient distribution, interconverts many organic molecules, and detoxifies many organic molecules. So really, the liver is there for an important reason, and that's to detoxify anything that we bring in. It also controls where the nutrients are going to go in the body. And so it's kind of the control center saying, okay, we got all these nutrients. Where do we need them the most? And it's kind of like the distribution center of the shipping center and says okay we need nutrients here we need nutrients here and the liver can do that it also detoxifies things so if there's toxins that you get in the food or if you're naughty and drink alcohol the liver does detoxify those things so that it becomes less uh, less of an issue in your body and detoxifies those types of things and so having a good functional liver is always important so you can see people that have uh, bouts of alcoholism and that stuff where they've destroyed their liver over a long period of time because their liver doesn't work as well you get things like cirrhosis sometimes you get liver cancer and other uh, liver damage that can have a major effect in how well uh, someone can detoxify the nutrients in their in their body and so when you get liver damage you start to see a lot of other things happen and so it's bad news all the way around so again you want to keep your liver happy because it's keeping you safe and so that's an important thing uh, when we think about that now with the fats again epithelial cells absorb the fatty acids and then the uh, monoglycerides uh, and then recombine them to triglycerides and that's how they're moved around in the blood and again uh, they're transported into the lacteal and lymphatic vessels of the villi and the lymphatic vessels develop uh, the cyclomicron containing lymph in large veins that return the blood to the heart and so that's how the fats get into the blood is actually through the lymphatic system and they promote it so here you can see here's a fat globule and the bile salts that are produced by your uh, again liver that's stored in the gallbladder help break down the fat droplet and they break it down into the fatty acids and the monoglycerides those things then get absorbed by the epithelial cells and they're formed into triglycerides which then end up in the lymphatic system not in the blood system but in the lymphatic system which is then carried away by the lymph system which then circulates back to the heart and so your lymph system is actually very important for moving fats around in your body so the fats do end up in your blood eventually but again most of the fats that are digested end up in the lymphatic system first and then are in and added into the uh, essentially into circulation through the veins near or around the heart because that's where the main lymphatic duct uh, uh, enters into the circulatory system. So again, and we'll talk more about the lymphatic system in chapter 35. Okay, now once the food enters into the large intestine, so the colon of the large intestine is connected, you have the cecum that adds in the fermentation of plant material and again, where the large and small uh, intestines meet. Now, in certain animals that are herbivores, they're going to have a much larger cecum, and that appendix actually does a lot more. And so what we've seen is that the appendix does contain some certain bacteria and other cells that help with immunology. And so 
Otherwise, we're not really sure what the appendix does other than causing issues in people when they have appendicitis. And so they get inflammation of that and it can cause problems because if it ruptures, you now get the leakiness of whatever was in the appendix into the, in the, into the surrounding tissues and that can cause a severe bacterial infection and that can be very bad for people. So that's why you have to get that taken care of if you do feel that inflammation or pain associated with appendicitis. So again, um, the main part of the large intestine though is to take the food and absorb the water that comes out of it. And so that's gonna be the key. And again, you have lots of wonderful little bacteria in there that help aid in the digestion in that, in that situation. And sure enough, here we talk about this. And so one of the major functions is to recover the water that has entered into the alimentary canal and again, the colon houses the bacteria that live on unabsorbed organic material and produce some vitamins for us. And again, the feces, which makes it through the large intestine, include undigested material, bacteria, and again, becomes more solid as it goes along because you're absorbing the water. Now, if you have a situation where you have diarrhea or something, you're, what's happening is your body is secreting water. And so a lot of times you can get bacterial infections or other types of infections that cause the intestines to secrete water. And that's why you get diarrhea. So normally, uh, normally your body will reabsorb most of the water. And so it should be more of a solid kind of feces as opposed to a very liquidy. If it's coming out liquidy, you may have some problems with reabsorption in that. And again, you may have some intestinal issues with inflammation or other things that are going on in your system. And I like this, the good and bad flora. Again, E. coli is good. The uh, bifidobacteria and then the lactobacilli are all good bacteria, and these are all part of the probiotics. Not only do they provide benefits, but the other thing that they do is when they grow in there, they're keeping the pathogens away. They're keeping the bad guys away, like Campylobacter, uh, Enterococcus faecalis, which can be bad, and then the Clostridium difficile. These guys are mostly pathogens, and they cause pretty much bad infections in your intestines, and so they cause... A lot of times watery diarrheas, bloody diarrheas, and uh, chronic diarrheas where they start eating away at the intestines. So they can be very bad news over a series of time. And so, again, if you want to know more about that, take microbiology and you'll, we'll, we'll definitely talk about some of the different uh, infections that go on in the intestines themselves. Now, the elimination part. So now if you've absorbed everything, you removed the water, you have now the elimination. And again, it makes it to the rectum, which is kind of the storing uh, site of the feces until it's ready to be eliminated. And again, there are two sphincters in those. You have the external anal sphincter and the internal anal sphincter, which control the elimination of the feces. And so again, those are uh, muscles that are very tight and again, relax when you're eliminating the feces at this part. And again, typically we have control over that. Sometimes we don't, depending on how much is being stored in the rectal area. And sometimes we get blocked up because we don't have enough fiber or water in the system. And so it gets backed up and that's what is called constipation where you can't eliminate during that time. Okay, now if we look at this, the evolutionary adaptations of vertebrate digestive systems correlate with their diet. And so digestive systems are, again, variations of the common plan. So whenever we look at the common plan, it's a long tube that essentially helps, again, with the four states of uh, digestion. So you have ingestion, you have digestion, you have absorption, and then elimination. And depending on what you're eating and what, what you're doing will determine what type of system you have. So you can see in the uh, insectivore, again, typically in the insectivore, which eats insects, again, there are uh, uh, a long, uh, short intestine, again, a short intestine in this case, and really no large intestine. It gets a little bit larger in that, in the elimination, but again, there's no cecum because they're not eating any um they're not eating any plants. And so again, they don't really need that digestion, so you don't see that in this case. Now, in a non-ruminant herbivore, uh, you see a simple stomach, which then passes into a very long intestine. You can see the cecum, which contains a lot of enzymes that help break down uh, plant material in that. And so you see a large one of those, and again, a large intestine to absorb the water. In a ruminant herbivore, which has, again, a rumen and a stomach, which holds a lot of these things, so a lot of digestion takes place here. You can see you have a very large, small intestine. 
uh, intestine in this case, uh, again, long, and then a large cecum, which helps digest any other further undigested plant material, and then a long, large intestine to help remove the water and any, any other absorption that needs to be done. And then a carnivore, what you see is a very short intestine and colon and a very small cecum because, again, you're primarily eating animals and not plants. And so if you don't have plants, in your diet, you're going to have a small cecum. Now, humans kind of in between because we're omnivores. Again, we eat plants, but a lot of the plant stuff we don't actually digest. We pass it through. And so, again, in our diet, plants are good because we get oils and minerals and that stuff from plants. But one of the things that's also good is we get fiber. And we don't digest that fiber, and it helps clean us out. And so that's why uh, fiber is always good because, one, it makes us full, and so we don't want to eat more. And two, it helps clean out the system because we don't digest it and so it passes through. And so it's a good good source to clean you out. So if you want to clean your system out and do one of those cleanses, eat a lot of fiber in those cases. Eat a lot of vegetables and that stuff, a lot of plants to help clean you out. Now, another thing that we see with the adaptations is the type of teeth. And so again, the type of teeth are going to revolve around what, what do you eat? And so in a carnivore, you're going to have teeth that are specialized for tearing and chewing. So you're going to see well-developed canines, you're going to see incisors, and then you're going to see molars to kind of grind and that stuff. And so that's what you see here. So the carnivore is going to be primarily for ripping and tearing. And so you're going to see well-developed teeth, especially in the front. And then the back teeth are going to be lesser developed. In a herbivore, you're going to see, you're not going to see really a whole lot of incisors and canines because you don't need to do a lot of ripping and tearing of muscle. You're going to see a lot of grinding though. So you're going to see a lot of premolars and molars in the back that help grind and break down the plant material. And then in an omnivore, you have both. And so in humans, a great example, we have incisors and canines that are developed to help rip and tear meat and other things that we eat. And then we have the molars back here that help grind any plant material as well as meat and other foods that we eat. And so it's, a, you know, it's one of those things that we see. Now, some animals even have other types of mechanisms that uh, help them eat. And again, for example, the teeth of a poisonous steaks have fangs that can inject venom. And so that can paralyze the host or the, not the host, but it paralyze the prey so that they can help help eat the thing and catch the catch it and eat it and do those things and so that's an important adaptation that you see not all animals obviously have uh fangs or uh, venom to inject and paralyze their their prey in these cases now again some other adaptations we talked about this with the type of food you eat so again the adaptation is an apparent length of the digestive system in different vertebrates many carnivores have a large expandable stomachs again for the amount of meat that they use and then herbivores and omnivores generally have longer elementary canals than carnivores because, again, they need longer time to digest the vegetation. So if you eat plants, you need more time to digest it. And so that's what you're going to see. And you're going to see larger cecums. Again, carnivores, less cecum because they don't need the bacteria and the vitamins and minerals that are not vitamin the enzymes to break down plant material because they're primarily eating meat, whereas those that eat uh, plants like herbivores and omnivores are going to have cecums to help digest the plant material that they eat. And again, humans are kind of in between because we eat more meat than plants, even though we're omnivores and that stuff, but we don't have well-developed cecums in the sense that, again, you look at our appendix and that stuff where you see here, ours is pretty short and again, containing some enzymes that help uh, digest that plant material. And again, ours is pretty small, kind of more like a carnivore than what you would see in a complete herbivore in this case. Now, again, a lot of times herbivores will have fermentation chambers in their elementary canals where microorganisms can digest the cellulose. And so, again, that's one of the things that we see. And so herbivores are going to have multiple chambers, especially in basically rumens, that are essentially helping digest. And so they have bacteria in there that help break down the cellulose. Again, in humans, we're omnivores, and so we don't really break that stuff down. And so that, again, helps us feel full and clean us out and those types of things. Now, other bacteria can uh, be very beneficial. Again, we have E. coli and other things that help provide vitamins and help break things back down. But obviously, we can get bacterial infections, and those can be a big issue in that. And so, again, one of the things that we see is that sometimes when we get pathogens, they can eliminate other species of bacteria from the stomach. And again, we see that these are the, one, these are the ones that cause the infection, and you can see that eliminates the bacteria, other bacteria that are normally in the stomach 
uh, when you have this type of infection. And so that's the problem too, is that people that have these infections with Helicobacter lose a lot of the other ones. Same with C. diff. And so one of the big problems with Clostridium difficile is that people have been on antibiotics for a very long time. And so it eliminates their normal microflora. So it allows for these guys to grow because the normal microflora is gone due to the antibiotics. And then what you see is these guys take over and then they get this chronic diarrhea that doesn't go away. So one of the ways to treat a patient that has C. diff is by eliminating uh, the antibiotics, which seems counterintuitive, but what happens is then you restore some of the native microbi microbiological environment. The other way, and a lot of people find this out and they go, wow, this is interesting, is they do what is called fecal transplants. And what they do is they take fecal material from other healthy people and they transplant it into people that don't have very good systems. And so people that have eliminated a lot of their normal bacteria to reestablish that bacterial population. It sounds weird, but it actually works really well. And so again, you may see this more and more common where people are going in. And again, typically how they do this is they make either pills or they inject it in or some way to get the fecal material in there. So it, it sounds gross, but it actually works really well. And so again, it's, it's an interesting concept, but it's done wonders for those that have suffered chronically from clustered into fissile and some other digestive uh, diseases that are out there because reestablishing the microbiome really helps in these situations. Now, other mutualistic adaptations, again, in herbivores, you have these rumens, which store a lot of these bacteria. They can help digest cellulose in that and break these down into simple sugars. And again, the rumens help break these things down. So things like cud shooting animals that include deer, sheep, and cattle have these large rumens that are basically these large filled bags full of bacteria that help break down the cellulose. And so that's why they're in herbivores and they are able to break down the stuff so well because they have these bacteria in it. It's another thing that we see in termites. The termites have the bacteria that help break down cellulose and so they can eat wood and break down the cellulose because they have the bacteria in their digestive system that are allow, allow them to do that. And so we see that in termites and ants, carpentry ants that break down the wood and then cause problems in our houses and that stuff. So that's the other issue you see there. Okay, and again, feedback circuits regulate digestion, energy allocation, and appetite. And again, animals' intake of food and nutrients are matched to the circumstance and need. We talk about that. And again, the regulation of digestion is uh, every, every step of the way. And so again, the enteric division of the nervous system helps regulate the digestive process. And you can see endocrines play a huge role in what regulates digestion. And so you have positive feedback. And so when food comes in, you get gastrin, which produces gastric juices from the pancreas and other places. You have other uh, hormones that secrete uh, gall, uh, from, again, uh, bile from the gallbladder and that in secretin, which releases bicarbonate. We talked about that last time in the CCK, which stimulates enzymes released from the um, pancreas. And then uh, you also see inhibition of certain things to stop the production of gastric juices once it's made its way through the intestine. So again, or into the intestine, out of the stomach. So now they can stop the chemical digestion in the stomach and producing the acid that you have in that. So that's these are all different feedback mechanisms. You can see some are positive and some are negative based on what is going on in the system. Okay, and again, energy allocation. This is all about bioenergetics and again, nutritional needs and the animal's energy use per unit is called its metabolic rate. And so one of the interesting things is that animals that have are warm blooded are gonna have higher metabolic rates because they use their metabolism to maintain the, again, how much heat they produce. Again, this can figure out the rate of heat loss, the amount of O2 consumed and the amount of CO2 produced. And we call that the metabolic rate. Now, like I said, and I was mentioning, and we're gonna see that here in a second, is that Metabolic rate is very tied very closely in especially endotherms because we can regulate it based on our body temperature. We need metabolism to keep us warm. And so if we don't eat enough, we get cold. And so that's one of the issues that, again, we need our metabolism to keep going so we can keep, keep our body temperature the same way. And so again, you see this organic molecules going in, digestion, absorption, breaking these things down. You do lose some heat off. And again, all these because we're taking and changing energy from one form to another, we do lose heat. And again, formation of ATP, and you can see all these different things, waste and loss of energy and that stuff. But again, enough to do the processes that we need. And so again, if we're deficient in any areas, we have problems in this internal environment. And that's always 
an issue in her cells. Now, the minimum metabolic rate is an animal, or again, maintaining this minimal metabolic rate for cell functions. And this metabolic rate, or BMR, is the minimum rate that non growing endotherm at rest on an empty stomach and is not experiencing stress. And so that would be the metabolic rate. What is your cells doing when you have an empty stomach? You're just kind of dormant, not doing anything. You're old, so you're not growing at all. So your body's not doing those types of things. So you're after the age of maturity and an adult. And essentially, you're just sitting there on the couch type of thing and not experience any stress. So couch potato, that would be your BMR. But anytime you're doing those things, you are looking at it. And so what we measure it typically is when we fast. And so that's what we look at when we look at your metabolic rate. You have to fast, so you're not eating anything again in an adult and you're not stressed out so those are the things and you can see that your BMR decreases as you get older and the reason for that is because you're still growing as an into an adult and so your metabolic rate is going to be much higher and then as you age it gets slower and slower and slower and that's one of the reasons why as you age you start putting more pounds on because your metabolic rate decreases because you're not doing metabolism as fast and so a lot of the stuff gets stored as opposed to breaking down and so when you're 20 it's easy to eat a whole pizza by yourself and not feel the effects but when you get to 40 and 50 it's much harder to look at that or you know to get rid of it you basically look at the pizza and you put on five pounds and that's just because your metabolic rate slows down as you as you go now again in an ectotherm is also caused the standard metabolic rate because again they're fasting and that stuff and an endotherm and ectotherm is a little bit different in the sense because they're more responsive to the external environment where these guys have to maintain internally so when we look at endothermy, again, it's more energetically costly than ectothermy because we have to maintain our metabolic, our, our basically our temperature. And so again, the colder it is, the more our metabolic rate goes up. And then as the temperature increases, the more the rate goes down. In an ectotherm, it's the opposite. The ectotherm really doesn't change until it really gets warm. And so the metabolic rate drops as the external rate drops. And so that's the ectotherm. And again, the as the external therm goes down, we got to maintain our temperature so we burn more. And so that's why the metabolic rate goes up as an endotherm. Ectotherm, it goes down because when they cool off, they slow down. And so they don't need to do as much because that's how they are. And so that's what you see. Ectotherm, again, you see the metabolic rate drops when the temperature drops. Endotherms, it actually goes up as the temperature drops because you got to maintain that body temperature. And so that's the issue there. Okay, and so again, regulation of energy storage. The liver and muscle cells are used first, and the energy is stored as glycogen. When these are full, excess energy is stored as fat. And so this is the issue that we suffer from. And so this is why. As humans, we're seeing an increase in obesity because we're taking in more calories, more food, and that stuff, and we're not using it as much. We're not being as active as we should. And so we see, again, in kids, the, the rate of obesity going up because they're eating very high sugary snacks, and that sugar is not being burned off, so they're not running around and playing anymore. They're playing video games and being sedentary. And so you see a decrease, and again, the decrease in the metabolic rate you're also seeing these things stored and so that's the problem and so when the fewer calories are taken in then it's expended the body expends the liver and glycogen mycoglycogen and then fat are then burned and so again it's all about calories in calories out but again we know that there's other factors in that stuff so it's easy to say oh yeah just stop eating but we need the nutrients as well and so one of the problems is is our diet in general and that stuff and you guys probably know by looking at that and seeing the problems that we have. If we have lots of sugar in our diet and those things, those things get stored, and that's why we see this increase in, in fat deposits and that stuff and why we're getting heavier and heavier and heavier is because there's a lot of sugar and processing in our foods, and they're not natural that the body that our body normally knows how to deal with, and that's one of the issues as well. Now, with glucose homeostasis, again, insulin and glycogen or glycogen, uh, glucagon are together maintained in glucose levels. Insulin rises after a carbohydrate-rich meal, and glucose entering the liver through the hepatic portal vein is used to synthesize glycogen, so it gets stored. When glucose concentration is low, the hepatic portal vein uh, glucagon stimulates lever, liver to break down glycogen and release glucose into the blood. And so in, insulin and glucagon are basically the feedback loops. 
when you don't have when you have glucose coming into the system insulin goes so it brings more glucose into the liver to be stored when those levels go down insulin goes down and then glycogen or glucagon comes up to then uh, produce again and release glycogen so it gets burned and so that's essentially what happens in the body so you can see here again feedback loops and so when the glucose level rises such as after eating you get in production of insulin that causes the transport of glucose into the cells and so then the blood level glucose level falls back to the normal level and then what happens if it falls too much like after fasting what happens is you get the secretion of glucagon and then glucagon causes the breakdown of glycogen and glucose into the blood and then you can see what the levels are so normally when we think about diabetes and that stuff and we're going to talk about that here in a second we have a dysfunction in this system and so this is why you have to fast when they're measuring your blood glucose because if you eat something it may cause the glucose levels to be too high and then it will give you a false a false high number you know type of thing so a false a false positive in this case I guess if you want to look at it that way whereas if you do fasting it's going to lower the levels to more of a, um, a maintenance level and again you're going to see where your normal glucose levels are based on that Okay, now again, the last thing we're going to talk about is diabetes. And again, diabetes mellitus is a disease caused by the deficiency of insulin or a decrease in the response of insulin in the target tissues. And so part of the problem is that glucose cannot, or cells can are unable to take up glucose to meet their metabolic needs. And so fat becomes the main substrate of cellular respiration. And so again, what happens in type 1 is that it's actually an immune response. And so what happens is that you have low insulin because the pancreas is essentially destroying the cell or the immune system is destroying the the pancreas in the production of insulin so you don't have enough insulin in your body to respond to the glucose levels and so you don't have unable to use the glucose due to in, uh, insulin so what happens is that the body is constantly using fat deposits to um, serve as the glucose source and so that can be an issue because again it affects circulation and affects a lot of other things that go on and it damages tissues over time now type 2 is when the insulin is not being recognized by glucose anymore and so the receptor is damaged in that and so insulin is not uptaking glucose right and this is typically due to a dietary thing and so again getting too much sugar in the diet and the insulin is not responding to the glucose levels anymore and so that's the issue here and so again you have high levels of glucose in the body and instead of keeping it in a nice steady state you have these fluctuations of going up and down either way too much glucose or crashing and so that can be an issue again in those situations now type 1 again is an autoimmune disorder typically it's genetic in that and the immune system destroys the pancreatic beta cells so again insulin is not being produced and so the issue there is that because the glucose levels are not responding to insulin you can go from very high to low depending on what you're eating and so people can go into coma with a crash because they don't have enough glucose in their body Type 2 is characterized by the failure of the target cells to actually respond to normal insulin. And again, heredity is a factor in type 2, as well as excess body weight and lack of exercise. So typically, it's associated with obesity and other issues with food consumption and that. And so we see that with the type 2. Type 1 is more of an autoimmune. And again, people are typically have genetic or hereditary effects with the type 1 in this case. Now, obviously, uh, again, we've talked about the over overnourishment, and that causes obesity, which results from excessive intake of food and stored as fat. And again, obesity contributes to diabetes, uh, cancer, breast, uh, and, uh, cancer of the colon and br uh, breast, heart attacks and strokes because you get fat deposits in the vessels. Is that? And again, we have discovered several mechanisms that help regulate body weight. I'm going to show you one of them here in just a minute. But one of the issues is, again, is consumption. And again, overconsumption, especially of high carbohydrates, and that is a big problem because that gets stored as fat. And so that's the issue. Now, one of the hormones that actually uh, triggers uh, uh, obesity is called ghrelin. And ghrelin is a hormone that is secreted by the stomach and it triggers the feeling of hunger before meals. And so this is a stomach, when, or I'm stomach, this is when you get that sensation of, man, I'm so hungry. I could eat like this whole pizza right now. I'm just so hungry. And that's that ghrelin that's really kind of triggering that, that sensation that you want to eat and gets you ready to eat. 
Then the insulin and PYY, a hormone secreted by the small intestines after you need to suppress the appetite. And so that's now slowing yourself down. So now that you're full, you want those things. And then there's another hormone, hormone leptin, which is produced by fat tissue that suppresses appetite. And again, depending on how many things you have there. One of the biggest issues, and again, I suffer from this, is eating too fast because it doesn't allow your body to send those signals fast enough to respond to appetite. And so what, what we have to do, and again, this is a problem with society in general, is we go too fast sometimes and we need to stop and enjoy our food. Because when we eat on the run and we eat very fast, we're not allowing our bodies to catch up and regulate our, our appetite. And so what happens is when we eat fast and we're just downing the food left and right, we're not getting the typical response that we see with our, our hormone levels and our hormones can't catch up. And so one of the things that they say is if you want to control your appetite and you want to make sure that you're not eating so much is slow down. You know, take take the number of bites and chew and then slow down and enjoy the experience. And so you can eat what you want, but if you slow down, your body is going to tell you, okay, I'm full. I don't need to eat anymore. But if you eat really fast and you're just, you know, downing everything left and right, your body doesn't have time to tell you you're full. And so you don't get the signal. And so you continue to eat until, you know, and then finally you feel like, oh, and then now you've overeat and now you have too many of these uh, over nourishment essentially. And now that gets stored as fat. So one of the ways they, they figured this out and again, just using it is just by slowing down. So I guess that's another way to look at it. Slow down, slow your roll so that you, you slow down in the digestion. And so look at that and see how that goes. Now, this is just a summary of how these things work. Again, we talked about the four stages of, of really physical digestion. Again, the mouth is the ingestion part. You bring it in, you chew it, you have secretions from the salivary glands that help break down the carbohydrates. It works its way down the esophagus to the stomach where you get secretions from the gastric glands, which not only do carbohydrates, but proteins. And then you get the digestion in the small intestine. Again, the secretion of different uh, enzymes in that from the small intestine, the liver, and the pancreas, which helps break down really all four major macromolecules, carbohydrates, uh, proteins, lipids, and nucleic acids. The lipids leave due to the bile in that, and again, the breakdown into the triglycerides, which end up in the lymphatic system, which end up then into the veins that go to the heart. And then again, the absorbed food, the absorption part in the small intestine and the large intestine take place and again, absorb it and go into the vessels that go to the liver. And then the liver can detoxify or tell where the nutrients need to go, what, what needs to go where, the central receiving kind of thing or central shipping and says, we're gonna ship this out to the rest of the body. And again, the large intestine is necessary for the absorption of water. And that's primarily what you see there as well as the microorganisms that you have there that help aid in digestion and help, um, again, provide certain vitamins and minerals that you might need. And then finally, any food that isn't digested gets eliminated through elimination and that goes through the rectum and anus. The rectum is kind of the holding center and then the anus when you're ready to uh, alleviate or expel the, the waste product. And so that's really looking at mammalian digestion and it really doesn't change except for, again, some of the adaptations depending on what type of organism you are. Again, herbivores have a, sometimes these large bags called rumens that have uh, bacteria that help break down the cellulose and help that go. Uh, they also have the cecum part of the large intestine that contain enzymes and um, bacteria that help break down, again, plant material. Carnivores, tend not to have any rumens. They have a short, uh, pretty much short intestine just to absorb. And then again, a short, small intestine and large intestine and then no cecum because again, they're not really digesting any plant material so it's not needed and then eliminated. And then omnivores are kind of in the middle in that. So again, that's kind of giving you the summary of the mammalian digestion. So we made it to the end. And again, we looked at animal diets that must supply chemical energy, organic building blocks and essential nutrients. And we talked about the essential amino acids, the essential lipids that you need, and then the vitamins and minerals and those things. And again, malnourishment is when you're lacking those things. And the most common thing that we're missing is vitamins and amino acids. And so again, that's where the the GMOs come from and that stuff. And so again, we talked about that before. Again, food processing involves the four stages, ingestion, which is coming through the mouth, digestion, which is the both the mechanical and chemical digestion of breaking the food down, absorptions, taking those food particles and bringing them in through the intestinal wall, 
and that is supplying the nutrients to the rest of the body. And then elimination is getting rid of the waste products in those sense, in those in those situations. Again, we talked about a lot of the different organs specialized for sequential stages of food processing. We took you through the mammals and the mammalian stages, and again, looking at what the stomach does, small intestine, large intestine, and then the accessory organs and what they do for digestion and aiding in both chemical digestion and mechanical digestion, and then finally absorption. And again, we looked at adaptations. We talked about that, the difference between herbivores and carnivores, not only in the digestive system, but the type of teeth they have. So again, looking at those things. And then we also looked at the feedback circuits that regulate digestion. And again, for energy, minerals, and that. And then again, slowing down, doing those things. But when things get out of whack, that can have a huge effect on the body. And again, too much of a good thing can lead to storage and then weight gain and all those other things. Okay, so with that, we made it to the end of the uh, this lecture. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask. You know, send me an email, whatever you need to do to contact me and that stuff if you have any questions. I'm glad you're watching the videos. Hopefully you're getting something out of it. Hopefully you learned something new uh, in that, and I will see you next time. Thanks for watching.